That's it for church announcements, guys. So if you would turn with me, please, in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 12. That's where we're at tonight. 2 Samuel chapter 12. Um, We tackled the rest of chapter 11 last week, and uh, what a sad chapter it was. Um, As we've seen this really low point in King David's life. I'm sure you remember uh, that King David should have been out to battle, right? Remember, it was springtime when the kings go out to battle, but David wasn't where he was supposed to be. Actually, David was chilling out in Jerusalem, in his palace, taking it easy, relaxing, and guess what? That's when David faced temptation, and David gave in to temptation. As he was up on that rooftop, he noticed that beautiful woman, a few rooftops over, taking a bath. And rather than David turning away and fleeing temptation, he decided to inquire of it. He asked who the woman was, and he was told this was Bathsheba, the wife, wife of Uriah the Hittite. Uriah was one of David's men fighting against the Ammonites out at battle. And David ends up bringing her over. He sleeps with her and she goes back home. And not long after, she sends word to David saying, Hey, dude, I'm pregnant. Yeah, this was a real problem. And that's when we saw David start to brainstorm ideas to hide his sin. He had this idea if he could bring Uriah home for a little R&R, off the battlefield well, he'd go sleep with his wife and then we could pass a child off as Uriah's. Hey, remember when you came home that weekend, Uriah? Yeah, well, I'm pregnant, right? That was the idea. And so that's what David does. He calls Uriah from the battle, tells him to go home, spend some time with his wife. But we saw Uriah was a great man of integrity. Uriah refused to go home and sleep in his bed with his wife. Why? Well, he says, how can I go home and and be with my wife when my comrades are on the battlefield? It isn't right. I will not do this thing. Well, David's next plan was, okay, well, fine, then I'll get him drunk, right? Integrity seems to go out of the window when one is intoxicated, but that didn't work either. And this is when David took it to the next level. He wrote a letter to Joab, the military commander. And he told Joab to put Uriah on the front lines where the fighting was the most fierce. And then abandon him so that he dies. And probably the saddest part is that David rolled up that letter, he sealed it, and he asked Uriah himself to deliver it to Joab. And so he did. Uriah unknowingly delivered his own death warrant to Joab. And it was so. Joab obeyed the king's orders. Uriah was struck down and died, and so did a bunch of other men. And we were able to see that this all started with one sin. And to conceal that sin, David had to sin again. And he had to sin again, and he had to sin again, until it ended up being just straight out premeditated murder. We've seen the progression that took place. We were also, excuse me, able to see that Uriah had no idea about the sin David had committed. He had no clue about the sin his wife or David committed with Bathsheba. He was clueless. He was innocent. He was a good man, yet he paid with his life for this sin. He paid, completely innocent of it. He died. And sin always affects other people, innocent people, and we'll see that again tonight. But hey, Uriah is dead, so David immediately marries Bathsheba. He can do that now. Now when her baby bump starts showing... No one's even going to ask a question about it. And it seems that David has gotten away with murder. But one thing is for certain. We may be successful at hiding our sins from others. We can hide our sins from family, 
from friends, from our pastors, from our church family, our coworkers, our spouse. Man, we could hide sin from everybody, but there's no such thing as a secret sin because God sees clearly everything that we do. The Bible says that. And God is about to remind David of that right now. So take a look at verse 1 with me of chapter 12. It starts out and it says, Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. Okay, who sent Nathan to David? The Lord sent Nathan to David. And uh, you know you're in trouble when you sin, and the next thing you know, there's a prophet knocking on your door, right? Yeah, I bet David was like acting like when J Dubs come to the door, he's like, Shh, hey, don't, don't peek out of the blinds. He's going to know I'm here, you know? <laughs> it says, And Nathan came to David and said to him, there were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But instead, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Now, as I was studying this, you know, something that I found interesting is when you look at how Jesus spoke to people in the Gospels, you would see that Jesus often spoke in parables, okay? You have the parable of the sower, the parable of the wheat and the tares, you, the parable of the mustard seed, right? Lots and lots of parables. Jesus oftentimes spoke in parables, and they always seemed to be about things that the people could relate to. Israel was big on agriculture, right? They couldn't just run to Walmart, Farming, planting, harvesting crops, right? So Jesus spoke the parable of the farmer sowing seed, right? He's getting on their level. This is how our Lord did it. He knew his audience. And it's interesting because our, our chapter starts out tonight with the Lord uh, sending Nathan to David with a message. And what does Nathan do? He tells David a parable. Surely the Lord speaking to David through his prophet, much in the same way he spoke to people while he was here ministering before his crucifixion, death, and resurrection. And the parable that Nathan gives was in true Jesus fashion, something David could relate to. This was a story about lambs and shepherds. And remember, before David was king, he used to tend his father's flock. David was a shepherd at heart. And so Nathan is speaking David's language here with this parable. Right away, this would have grabbed David's attention. And in the parable, we're told about two different men. One was a rich man, and we're told this rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds. The other man in the story was, well, he was the, the opposite, he was a poor man, and the text says he didn't have anything except this one little lamb, ewe lamb. What's a ewe lamb? Well, it's a young, unweaned female lamb. That's all the poor man had, this one little lamb, and the poor man loved his little lamb. As a matter of fact, we're told he bought it, he nourished it, the little lamb grew up with him and his children. It ate off of his plate, it drank out of his cup, and it would even cuddle up and sleep next to him at night. The little lamb had become part of his family. The text says it was like a daughter to him. Well, here comes this traveler. He comes to town. Hospitality was big in that day. And so the rich man needed to prepare a meal for the traveler. But rather than taking one of the sheep from his own flock, he went and stole that one little lamb that the poor man had. And he slaughtered it, and he prepared it for the traveler. Really sad story, isn't it? Yeah, 
And can't you just see David's face as he's being, I don't know what David looks like to you in your mind. I know what he looks like in mine. But can't you see his face, you know, getting red, jaw clenched, his eyes are watering as he's remembering the good old days of, of his little lambs and how he would fight bears and lions to protect them? Actually, look at David's response in verse 5. It says, so David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. See, David didn't know this was a parable. David thought this was a true story. That, that was taking place somewhere in his kingdom. And David's anger was greatly aroused, so much so that David immediately sentences the guy to death. The man who did this, the man who had no pity, the man who took that one little lamb from that guy shall surely die off with his head. And you know what? Death isn't even enough punishment in David's eyes. He's going to give back four times what he took from that poor man, which is what the law commanded. Oh, well, David knew the word. David's thinking, what a scumbag this guy is. Where is he at? Bring him to me now. And now in verse 7, Nathan explains the parable. He says, Nathan said to David, you are the man. Ouch. David, you are the man. This is the key to unlocking the parable. Parables always have a key that unlocks them. This is the key. David is that rich man. He's the rich man with exceedingly abundant herds and flocks that took that one little lamb from the poor man. I bet David's heart stopped for a moment as he realized that his sin wasn't hidden. David immediately understood what Nathan was speaking of here. You see, in the parable, David was the rich man. David was the king. David had many herds and flocks. David had many wives and concubines. Uriah was the poor man. He only had one little lamb that he loved more than anything. And that one little lamb was Bathsheba, his wife. And David stole her from him. Wow. David sentenced this man to death for what he had done. And he just realized that by his own words, he should be sentenced to death. God saw it all. The Lord saw everything David had done. Nothing is hidden from God, and we do well to remember that, church. And now the Lord has some words for David. You are the man, David. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. Verse 8, I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel. And Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more, David. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon, Israel's enemies. Look at what God is reminding him of here. David, I've blessed you so much. I, I made you king over Israel. I kept you safe from Saul all those years. How many times did Saul throw a, a spear at David's head? I gave you a beautiful house, cedar planks. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. Man, I've blessed you so much. And I would have given you even more if it wasn't enough for you, David. But your response to all these blessings I've given you was to do evil in my sight. 
Notice that when we sin, when we do evil, even if we do it secretly, God says, you did it in my sight. That, that should send shivers down our spines. But isn't it interesting how when we're tempted, we tend to kind of forget about how much God has blessed us. We tend to forget what God has done for us. Kind of like we just get tunnel vision. God is saying, let me remind you of how you got where you're at. I made you king. I protect you. I put you in the house you're in. I blessed you. You know, when's the last time you sat down and really thought about how God has blessed you? Because, man, we can get so caught up on what we don't have, the few things we're lacking, but God has blessed us so much, guys. Raise your hand if you're saved, right? All right, we can start there. Raise your hand if you have a bed to sleep in tonight. All right. Raise your hand if you have someone who loves you. Right? Raise your hand if you have something to eat tonight. Right? The list goes on and on. And reminding ourselves constantly of how God has blessed us, not only materially, but spiritually is a great way to help us to resist and stand firm against temptation. Because that's what God's doing here. He's reminding David of how he has blessed him. Perhaps if David had went up on that rooftop and been thinking of how God had blessed him with a rooftop to go up to, none of this would have happened. But instead, he despise the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight. You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. And so verse 10 says, Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Notice he's not saying Bathsheba. He never mentions her by name. The Lord keeps saying Uriah's wife, Uriah the Hittite's wife. It's like the Lord's really driving it home here. Thus, verse 11 says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. Ooh. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, and sin always does, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. Then Nathan departed to his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became ill. And so we just see here a tough section of Scripture. Um, and something you always hear me repeat, guys, especially in this book, is that sin has consequences. And in some way, shape, or form, the innocent will pay for the sins of others. They will pay consequences for other people's sins. And what we're reading here is the consequences of David's sin. The world calls it karma. But what we're seeing here is divine judgment. First, He's told the sword shall never depart from his house. And David would always face violence and death in his own family. He used violence and death against Uriah. Secondly, 
the Lord will raise up adversity against you from your own house. And we're going to see all this come to pass as we get further along in the book. But one of David's sons, a man named Absalom, would rebel against David and try to take the throne from him, and it got real ugly. Thirdly, the Lord will take David's wives right before his eyes and give them to another man. This will also come to pass in future chapters by David's son, Absalom. As a matter of fact, he takes David's concubines to the same roof that David was on when he saw Bathsheba, and he sleeps with David's concubines up there in the sight of all Israel. And fourthly, the child Bathsheba is pregnant, the child that Bathsheba is pregnant with uh, will surely die. What did that child do? That's the thing about sin, guys. Oftentimes, innocent people will pay for it. And when we look at this judgment of the Lord, we see a lot of similarities to what David did to Uriah, don't we? For example, David took Uriah's wife and slept with her secretly, and so the Lord's going to take David's wives, and someone will sleep with them openly. David murdered Uriah. And now David is going to experience loss for himself as his child would die. And that's a, a hard thing for us to comprehend. We can't pretend that we don't see what the text says. It says the Lord struck the child. And uh, this is definitely one of those verses, guys, where we need to lean not on our own understanding. And, and trust and know that God is holy and God is just. You know, the Bible's full of innocent people paying the consequences of sins. We can go all the way back to the garden in which Adam and Eve sinned and tried to cover their nakedness with leaves. God made them coverings of skin, okay? Something innocent had to die to cover them up. Not only that, but all of creation has been paying the price of Adam and Eve's sin. Or we can look to the great example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was without spot. He was without blemish. And the Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin, that we might be the righteousness of God. Jesus was completely and perfectly innocent. He was sinless, yet he died horrible death to pay the penalty of our sins his blood was shed for the sins of others the sins of the world we can look to the whole sacrificial system in israel the passover where innocent animals animals would be sacrificed to cover the sins of other people but that lamb didn't do anything wrong Yet it had to die for the sins of others. We can even look to Uriah, a man of integrity, a man whom loved his wife, his country, and God. Had absolutely no idea what had transpired with David and his wife. The sin was committed in secret while he was miles away on the battlefield. Yet Uriah died as a result of David sinning. Just another example of innocent paying the consequences of the sins. And here we see innocent paying the consequence of someone else's sin as this child would be struck and die as a direct result of David's sin, as a divine judgment against him for his sin. This is one of the reasons, guys, that God hates sin, because it hurts and it destroys people, both innocent and the sinner themselves. And if there's any comfort at all found in David's child dying, we know that that child was immediately with Jesus in heaven. He just skipped all this mess here on earth. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And next week, we're going to see a verse that proves to us that all children 
before the age of accountability, whatever that is, that die are short-circuited straight into heaven into the arms of our loving Savior. We're going to see a verse there. And if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you will see them when you get there. But I want us to hone back in on verse 13. Take a look at it again with me. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. David deserved to die. Not only was this punishment according to the law for the crime of adultery, but David himself, as we saw, unknowingly passed a death sentence on himself when he was told the parable of the little lamb that was stolen from the poor man. But we see that David, in verse 13, confessed his sin. He acknowledged his sin. And look what it says. I have sinned. Against who? Against the Lord. This was true confession of sin. Notice that David isn't trying to make up any excuses well, Lord, you know I struggle with women, you know, <laughs> always have. And next thing I know, there I was, and then there she was, and, you know, she kind of tricked me. And oh, Well, Lord, you, you know, if I knew it would result in all this, I surely wouldn't have did it. Well, Lord, if she hadn't been bathing on the roof, then none of this would have happened. Well, Lord, I was just really lonely that night. You know, I've been really depressed lately. I'm not happy with all my other wives. The devil made me do it. No, none of that. We don't see any of that. David didn't try to make any excuses. He didn't try to blame shift. He didn't try to drag anyone else in it, including Bathsheba. He didn't try to minimize what he had done, which is so often times what people try to do. He owned it. And he confessed it. I have sinned. I have sinned. No one made me do it. No one else helped me to do it. I did it. I have sinned. And then he acknowledges who the sin was truly against. I mean, sure, he, he sinned against Uriah, even Joab commanding him to murder this guy. But all sin is sin against God. And David says, I have sinned against the Lord. This is the first step of true repentance. The next is turning away from that sin and back to God. And David truly did repent of this sin as you will never see him do this again the rest of his life. As a matter of fact, let's all turn to Psalm 51. Everyone turn in your Bibles with me to Psalm 51, please. We're going to start bringing it into a landing here by reading that psalm together. Psalm 51. I'll give you guys a second. Psalm 51. It's right after Psalm 50. All right, everyone there? All right, so for time's sake, obviously we can't break this psalm down, but I want us to at least read it, and the reason why I want us to read it is found in the title of the psalm. It says, a prayer of repentance to the chief musician, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So this is David wrote this right at the section we are in our text. This is a psalm of David wrote after he confessed his sin in our chapter that we've been studying tonight, and it starts out like this. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, the sin with Bathsheba and Uriah. 
For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. That you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. And so David's confessing his sin and who his sin's against. And he knows the judgment that we saw God bring upon him in our text tonight, he says, is just. Verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make, known, make me to know wisdom. So he's acknowledging he's a sinner. He says, I was brought forth in iniquity, in sin my mother conceived me. In other words, I was born a sinner. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Remember, God removed his spirit from Saul. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation. Speaking of Uriah here. And my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. And this is why. Because the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. David's acknowledging that all the burnt offerings in the world are nothing to God. What God desires is a broken and contrite heart. A heart broken over the fact that he had sinned against God. Do good, do, do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness with burnt offering and whole burnt offering then they shall offer bulls on your altar. So really neat being able to go from our text in Samuel, exactly where we're at, and, and see where David wrote Psalms about that very moment. And so a little homework lesson for you. Before you go to bed tonight, I want to encourage you to turn back to this psalm. Psalm 51. And I want you to read it slowly and carefully with the context of David's sin in the back of your minds and see what else you can find in this psalm. What do you notice about David's repentance? Couples, this would be a great thing for you and your spouse to do together. Both of you read that psalm and discuss with one another what each of you found in it. Now here's the thing, the second half of verse 13 in our Samuel text and verse 14 says this, the Lord also has put away your sin, you shall not die, however, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. Guys, this shows us something. That after David confessed his sin, repented, as we saw in Psalm 51, the Lord forgave David. The Lord put away his sin, but notice the consequences of that sin still had to be paid. If you're robbing banks and one day the Lord gets a hold of you, and you give your life to Christ and you confess to him, Lord, I'm a bank robber. And I repent of robbing banks. I'm done with it. I'm never going to do it again. I want to live for you. And you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Guess what? It doesn't mean that the FBI is not going to kick down your door next week and take you to prison the rest of your life. 
David would still lose his child. He would still have adversity against him in his own house. He would still have another man sleep with his wives. The consequences still had to be paid, guys. But the most important part was that David was forgiven. By God, he was forgiven. And it reminds me of the cross. The Bible says that every single one of us were guilty of sin. And the consequences of those sins was death. The wages of sin is death. Spiritual, eternal death in a place called hell. That was the consequence that had to be paid for sin. But for every person who has put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, then the Bible says they are forgiven. John the Baptist pointed at Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. God put David's sins away. But even though we've been forgiven of our sins, washed white as snow, as Psalm 51 says, the consequences of our sins still had to be paid. And they were paid by the blood of Jesus Christ. The innocent Son of God who willingly went to the cross and took our sins upon himself and imputed his righteousness to us. A transaction took place on the cross. He cloaked us in his righteousness and took our sins. Washed us white as snow. He was buried. Three days later, rose from the dead, victorious over sin and death. But sin had a spiritual consequence far worse than physical consequences, and it was one that we will never fully understand what it cost our Lord to pay. And so two main lessons to take home tonight as we wrap it up now. Last week we saw that no sin is secret, and trying to hide our sin leads to more sin. And this week we see that sin has consequences. The more that we're trying to hide it, the more sin we're committing to hide it, the more consequences are going to come with it. God put away the spiritual consequences on the cross for everyone who will put their faith in his son, Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean that future sins will not have physical consequences on this earth. David would still pay for his sins with Bathsheba, even though God forgave him. And oftentimes, innocent people will pay them like Uriah and David's son. And two, we saw that we serve a loving and merciful God, man. David deserved death. He deserved death. But in God's grace, he allowed David to confess his sins and to truly repent of them. And the text says, God put away David's sin and he would not die. How thankful are we to Jesus when we look at this through spiritual lenses? Yes, we may pay the consequences of our sins here on earth, just like the bank robber, just like David. But Jesus paid the consequences of our sins, spiritually speaking which is far more important. Let's go before him as a church body and thank him for that. And so, Lord, we uh, first want...